We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a podcast, a blog, and a YouTube channel that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home with paint, power tools, and thrift stores without sacrificing your budget, the environment, or style. Welcome to episode 71 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. Can you tell that I'm feeling better? (laughs) Last episode, I told you that my whole family contracted covid and I sounded horrible. So I apologize for those of you who actually made it through to the end. I'm feeling so much better. I think you can tell that from my voice. I sat down here to talk about sewing today, and it got me excited thinking about my sewing machine. I love sewing, and I realized I have been using my sewing machines for so many years, even on upholstery projects and other things that I've done for my home, but I've never actually talked about sewing. And I realized there are some of you out there who have, I don't know, maybe a little bit of experience with sewing, but there's some of you who just have always wanted to learn, but you never took that jump. Well, I'm hoping that today, after this episode, if you do not have a sewing machine, you are gonna put it on your list of things that you wanna get and things that you wanna learn how to do with that sewing machine. I love it. I think even though I don't pull it out that often. I think it's one of those tools that if you are a creative person, you need a sewing machine. It has to be there in your arsenal. So when you want to make curtains or if you want to do pillows, you have it there. You can just whip something up real quick. So I want to share with you how I got started with sewing. What was it about the sewing machine that drew me to it? (laughs) Well, it's kind of funny because Right after I graduated from University of Maryland, and let me preface this by saying I have always throughout my entire life been a creative person. When I was eight, nine, 10 years old, I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a writer and funny how I'm getting to do that today. But I would draw little cartoon characters and, you know, I've always wanted to take clothing and repurpose it into other things. And I just never had an opportunity to do a lot of those things as I got older, because I mean, we didn't have money for a sewing machine. And sometimes there's just something that happens to you that just sparks you. And, and it's like, I don't know what it is. It just sets your soul on fire. Well, that happened to me one day after I graduated from the University of Maryland, I didn't have a job. Well, I ended up getting a temp job and you know, with temp jobs, you don't really make connections with the people there because you're not going to be there for very long. So I think at this point I was there for maybe a couple of months and I'm sitting there at my desk and I hear a couple of the women talking about going to lunch. And one of them said, I'm going to go to the fabric store. I want to go to the fabric store. And my ears shot up. I just remember this fire in my belly that just made me shout out. I said, I want to go. And they're like, oh, okay, you can come along with us. And I went, I, I found a pattern for this cute little wrap skirt. I bought the fabric and within probably a couple of days, I went and bought a sewing machine. I mean, it wasn't a very expensive one. I think it was like a brother machine and I paid maybe $150. So it was not very expensive, but there was something in me that just lit up like a Christmas tree when I heard fabric store, because inside of me, I'd always wanted to make things but I don't know why. I don't know why I never did that other than not having the money for a machine. I think out of my family, I was really the only one that was creative. And so nobody really sparked me to explore those things that I wanted to do. Now, I do know that I would go to the thrift store and I would find dresses and I would hem them. Of course, again, no machine. So I did them by hand. And funny story, one of my favorite thrift store dresses I found for $2 and it looked like the little polyester dress that I used to dress my Barbies up in. (laughs) I mean, I was a tomboy, but I loved Barbies. And this dress, this polyester dress looked like one of the wrap dresses that I dressed my Barbie up in and I bought it for $2. Well, it was a little too long. Of course, now I wish I would have not cut it because literally I still have this dress in my closet and I can still fit it. <laughs> and if you look, you can see the the stitching that I had so carefully done by, via hand. And the funny thing is, is that 
I knew how to do it so that that stitch was invisible, that it didn't show through to the other side, you know, this invisible hand stitch. And I still have that dress. So in high school, I was doing those things, but getting a machine wasn't possible. I never even really considered it. We didn't have money. But that moment when those women wanted to go to the fabric store, I said, let's go, <laughs> let's do it. I want to come with you. And so from there, I started getting a lot of patterns. I bought a lot of fabric, taught myself how to make pants. I made shirts, dresses. I mean, I made everything as much as I could. And it wasn't, it really wasn't about being thrifty, right? Because we all know by the time you buy all these materials, especially with sewing, fabric is never cheap. By the time you buy all these, or, or you know, I'm saying fabric, you know, for, well, you're a creative person, you know that a lot of times when you're buying a ton of materials, it's not as cheap sometimes as going and just buying what you need. And especially with sewing, when you're buying certain types of fabric, it can be expensive. But we'll talk about that in just a moment, because overall, I don't think that sewing has to be a very expensive hobby. And I think people think that it is. But if you're finding materials that are on sale, if you're buying fabrics over in the remnant section, it can be cost efficient to to buy those things and be able to make some skirts and pants and things like that. Well, that's what I was doing. I was going to the store, buying fabric and making pants and and dresses. And I actually still have, I think maybe one of the dresses, I think it even fits too. I'd have to probably release some of the fabric in the back because I have expanded a little bit over the years. But I think I might have been like 23 when I made this dress and it Actually, you know, it kind of reminds me of, I think it might be, is it Southwest? There's some flight attendants that wear like a button down blue dress. <laughs> and that's what it looks like. I'm going to have to try it on and take a picture of it and I'll have to post it somewhere. But anyway, these are the things I started working on. I started on clothes and then at one of my favorite fabric stores here in the Washington DC area, there's a store called G Street Fabrics. And they have this beautiful silk. I mean, it was kind of expensive. It, like I think at that time it might have been, is it $18 a yard? It was kind of expensive, but I found this fabric and I loved it. And I just started buying every single piece of like fabric that they had in this, this uh, silk, silk brocade, uh, like a Chinese bro silk brocade fabric. And I started making handbags and I taught myself how to make like these cute little shoulder bags and I was selling them. I started a little business and this is when I was working out, you know, I was working outside of the home. I had a few quote unquote customers cause I really thought I was like doing something big here, but it was so much fun learning how to make these bags and people would buy them and just absolutely love them. And then later when I had children, I sort of I sort of moved away from the clothes and the handbags and I started getting into baby diapers and baby shoes and baby carriers. These things were so much fun to make. And my oldest son, he's 15 now. I remember making his first pair of shoes. They look like a little pair of you you've seen like if you if you've gotten baby shoes for kids, there's this one particular style of you know, this, this little booty that just slides onto their feet. Well, I made him those booties and my sewing machine at that time had an embroidery factor or feature, not factor. It had an embroidery feature. So I did like K for his initial, his first initial. And then I did an A for his last initial. So he had customized baby shoes for like the first year of his life. <laughs> he started walking at nine months. So, you know, for at least a good few months, I was able to put him in some baby shoes. And then I realized, wait a minute, they're actually getting his feet wet. <laughs> so then I got smart and I started putting some uh, waterproof material inside of the shoe so that if he stepped on puddles, his foot wouldn't get wet. Anyway, it was just fun. It was fun to make these things. Baby carriers, I started selling those. I even had people, well, I say people, it was maybe one or two people from the internet that just found my website and wanted me to make them baby carriers. And I did. So it was a really fun time in my life experimenting with how can I start a business with some of these things that I'm sewing. It was a lot of fun. Of course, you know what came next, this house in 2010. And I realized, wait a minute, I've got curtains I need to make. I've got like chairs I want to reupholster. And I started using my sewing machine in these ways. 
Also, there was a really cool project that I made several years ago where I made a garage door screen. I think I was talking about that last week. And I had to sew the zipper in. I had to sew the zipper in. Otherwise, there was no way to get in and out and have all those gaps be sealed up. So my love of sewing has always been there. And it just depended on what was going on in my life at the time for what I was going to make. But I've gained all of these skills And whenever I am sitting down to use my sewing machine, it brings back memories of these happy times when I would get to sit down for hours and just work on clothes or handbags or baby shoes or diapers or carriers. And I'd have on the Golden Girls because, you know, I love listening to the Golden Girls when I work. (laughs) Whether I'm listening or watching, I love it. And sitting down at my sewing machine, it's very therapeutic to take pieces of fabric together and sew them together, whether I'm making curtains or doing an upholstery project, because it's just another tool in my arsenal for me to be able to create whatever is in my mind that I want to, that I want to make. So that's why I wanted to cover just a few things about sewing machines and about getting started, maybe some of the notions that you need to buy and to let you know that it doesn't have to be an expensive hobby that you get into. There are some machines, I will tell you, there are some machines that can be so expensive. (laughs) And when I started, like I said, I just got a brother machine, I think it was about $150, maybe even 200. I don't know, it just it wasn't expensive. And I don't remember how long I sewed on that machine for. But eventually I worked my way up to an industrial sewing machine. And I remember I live in the DC, Maryland area. I'm in Silver Spring. And I remember driving all the way in my little, you know, four door car down to somewhere in Virginia. And I bought an industrial sewing machine. And I remember trying to transport this thing back. But it was a Juki. And it was $800. And that was a big step up from the brother, but I wanted this this sewing machine because it was industrial. And with industrial machines, you can, they're so heavy duty that you can sew through so many layers of fabric and it's not going to get jammed up. It's just going to cut through that fabric and sew them all together, all the layers like butter. Now, remember at this time when I got that machine, I was doing silk handbags, some of the parts of like the bag would be really thick. And I found that that brother machine, it just wasn't cutting it. I couldn't get through all those layers. So that's why I upgraded to the Juki machine. Well, then I decided that I was going to get a Bernina. And I think I had the Juki machine for, I don't know, maybe like a year. But there were some features that I wanted on the Bernina. Bernina, for some reason, I was thinking it was a German brand. It's not. It's a Swiss brand. And you can't go into just a regular store and find it. They have dealers. So you've got to find an authorized Bernina dealer in order to buy the machine. Now there are a couple that you can buy online, but oh my gosh, I just looked it up and there are some machines that are like a sewing machine slash quilting machine slash embroidery machine. That thing was like (laughs) $13,000. I laugh at that because there's no way in heck I am paying $13,000 for a machine. Now, if it was you know, if it was my bread and butter and I was, you know, creating products that I needed to sell, then yeah, I could buy it and write it off. But no, that's just entirely too much. I think usually Bernina machines run anywhere from probably three to $5,000, which is still a lot of money. And I think back when I bought my Bernina machine, I want to say it was about, gosh, it might have been about $1,800. It was probably on the lower end of the ones that they have. And then I spent like an additional thousand to get the little attachment so I could do embroidery. I didn't use the embroidery that often. And that part, I just wish I wouldn't have bought that. But my Bernina machine, I've had this for my oldest son is 15. I'm pretty sure that I bought this machine at least a year or two before he was born. So I want to say it's like 16 years old and it's still sewing like Oh my gosh, it's amazing. It's amazing. However, you don't have to buy an expensive machine. You can get a brother if you're just learning how to sew, spend $150, get comfortable with just putting fabric together and sewing seams and doing some of your projects. Like if you're doing upholstery projects, or maybe you want to make curtains, get comfortable doing those projects. And then once you feel like, okay, I'm loving this hobby. This is great. I think I want to like get a better machine, then you can kind of move up, get a machine that's maybe computerized. But even that, 
might be overkill for you. But anyway, let me go back a little bit. So as I mentioned, all of these things I used to sew, but really the main thing that I focus on now is sewing for the home. And it's not often that I have to do this. If I'm making curtains or in like, for example, the recent project that I did, if you've seen it on my uh, YouTube channel, I made this cute little canopy, DIY canopy with mosquito nets. I mean, it turned out so cute, but in order for the mosquito nets to even work properly, the way I envisioned it in my head, I needed my sewing machine. And I had to sew some of the Velcro tape at the top. And then I had to sew just like a bias tape at the bottom. And I did put weights in there, curtain weights, so that it didn't flow whenever the wind blows. And just sitting down with my machine, it felt so nice. I just, I love sewing. It's very therapeutic when something actually comes together. <laughs> You're taking raw materials and sewing them together into something that just works. In fact, the mosquito netting was so much fun to work with that I decided I'm going to make probably for Halloween some sort of like skirt. You know, maybe you do like a like a bodysuit underneath and sew some elastic into the waistband and then do I don't know, maybe some you need something to kind of weigh it down at the bottom because it's so sheer. Um, but maybe do like a little bias tape at the bottom. And I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to become for Halloween, but I'm going to use that leftover mosquito netting to sew something cute. <laughs> okay, getting back to the machines, I just want to talk to you a little bit about if you do spend a little bit of money on your machine, there are probably some features that you will that you will get. And like I said, if you're just learning, you don't necessarily need all of these all of these things, but as you decide, okay, I love sewing, this is something that I'm going to be doing more often, I want to have a good machine, then you get into some of the more expensive features. And I'm going to I'm just going to say like some of the features that Bernina has. This is not sponsored by Bernina in any kind of way. I'm not promoting them. I'm just telling you what some of the features are because I want them <laughs> in the new machines. And I do think, you know, some of these these features are really great to have, but you know, the more money that you spend, the more features that you're going to get. It's probably going to be a quieter machine. I do know that when I was working on my brother machine, that thing would vibrate the entire table. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if you're if you're really cranking that thing up and it's you know, not only is it not going to be as fast and as quiet, um, but you're going to have to do a lot of manual things in order to get that machine to work, right? Like you've got your stitches on top and you have your stitches on the bottom. And it's this, you know, amazing... I want to say it's like a, an amazing dance between the thread coming from the upper part of the machine and the thread coming from the bottom. And they have to meet in just the right tension in order for that stitch to look good. Well, with more expensive machines, you don't have to fight it as much, right? You're going to get, uh, your tension is going to be, how do you say? It's going to be more adaptive. Like it's going to kind of know what to do and you're not going to have to fool with it very much. So I think this is something that Bernina does well. I know in their new machines, I think they've even improved it. I mean, again, my machine is 16 years old, so I can't even imagine how amazing it is to sew in one of these new machines. In fact, I think I went maybe two years ago, it might have been two years ago, in order to get a quote on a new machine just to see how much it was. And I'm pretty sure it was like five or $6,000. <laughs> I was like, that's like the, um, the, the, the amount of money for a you, like a, a small little used car. Like I just could not justify it. So I walked out thinking, you know, there's nothing wrong with my Bernina machine, like my little $1,800 machine. Okay. I'm keeping that baby, but just keeping that in mind, if you're just starting out, don't be afraid to get a brother machine. Don't be afraid to get a singer machine. You can probably get them for about 200, maybe even 500 is pushing it. And the more money that you spend on a machine, you're going to get, maybe even a touch screen so that if you want to like just push a button and you want to go from a straight stitch to maybe like a zigzag stitch, maybe you're going over the edge of a piece of fabric and you want to prevent that from unraveling. You're doing a little, you know, a little stitch on the side there. Yeah. You're going to be able to easily just push a button and make the change. You know, if you get a cheaper machine, you're going to have to turn a knob. I mean, it's not really that big of a deal when you're just starting out. 
But if you're committed to it and you, you've you given it a try, you've kind of used this brother machine for everything you could, and now you're ready for the next set of features, then you can upgrade at that time. I think probably, I don't know, I feel like I want the new machine because for, for Bernina, because when I went to look at it, <laughs> they have this feature and I can't justify spending a lot of money on a new machine just for this feature, but they have this really cool feature where if you push a button, you know, okay, for those of you who are listening who sew, or even if you don't sew, just imagine this with me. When you're done sewing a line of fabric, uh, joining two seams together, or jo- joining two pieces of fabric together to make a seam, you have usually some stitches at the be- or some threads at the beginning, and then at the end, when you're done sewing that that piece of fabric, you've got some strings that are hanging off the back, right? And usually you take your little snippers and you snip it off, you snip it close, and it becomes very annoying to have to do that, right? That's how we've all grown up with sewing. We've we've always known that to be the case. Well, now with Bernina, and I'm sure other machines are incorporating this as well, you just freaking push a button and it snips it for you. (laughs) And that's it. You pull it out and your stitching is clean, there are no threads to, to snip. And I didn't think that that was such a great feature until I sewed that mosquito net fabric. Because every single time that I needed to, you know, pull that thing out, I had to grab my scissors, snip off all those little extra strings. They were everywhere. They got attached to everything. And I started thinking, I was like, hmm, maybe I should look at that new Bernina. Like, is it really that great? Yeah, I think it is. (laughs) I think it is. But those are things that you're going to have to pay for. It's not, you know, it's not a a deal breaker for getting rid of a new, uh, of an old machine that works well. But, you know, I mean, I think if I had somebody in my life who was sewing and I, I wanted to gift the old machine to them, then I could do that and say, oh, I can get my new machine. But I just, I can't, I can't see getting a new machine just for that feature. But I can tell you, I'm looking forward to it. So again, the more expensive, the more features, don't worry about it when you're just starting out, but just keep in mind, you might want those things as you, you start sewing more. All right. So let's talk about what some of the notions and accessories are that you might want to purchase. I think for people who are just getting started, you don't have to buy a lot of things to get started with sewing. I mean, here are the, here are the things that I think are the bare minimum. And I think you probably would spend, I don't know, third, well, I'm going to say 30, let's say a hundred dollars, not even a hundred dollars, depending on what you buy. So small, and I'm going to call them small snipping scissors, but they could have a better name. Again, these are the little small ones when you're pulling your, your work out of your machine and you need to cut those threads, you need some little snipping scissors. So you need some of those. You'll need needles, of course. Now, when you buy your machine, it's going to come with needles but you always want to have more needles um, in your your sewing pack because I always tend to break them. (laughs) When you're sewing, I don't know about other machines, but for my machine, when I'm sewing, I'm able to move that needle to the left or right. And I do that sometimes depending on what I'm sewing. Well, when I go to move it back to the middle, sometimes I accidentally bring my needle down and it hits the metal of the foot and just breaks. <laughs> I, I do this all the time, all the time. And so it's always good to have some needles that are just there for the times when you break a needle. You also just need some really sharp scissors. Scissors can be very expensive. I mean, I don't know what your version of expensive for me, $30 is expensive. And I'm sure there are more expensive scissors, but $30 maybe even 20, 25, you can get a, a nice pair of scissors. You also can get a rotary cutter. I love rotary cutters. So when you're cutting out fabric, let's say you're doing a chair that you're making over and you've got your fabric laid out, you've got the old pieces of fabric off the chair, you've got them laid down onto the new fabric. Sometimes it's hard cutting that out with scissors and you don't really get a nice, clean, crisp, even if you've got sharp scissors, you don't get a nice, clean, crisp cut because when you're cutting with scissors, there's that cutting motion, right? So it's like every time you go to cut, sometimes it can just, it can be uneven. So if you've got a rotary cutter where you're literally, I mean, it looks like a pizza cutter. You're literally just outlining your, 
your fabric or your your pattern onto the new fabric and you get a really nice cut. And I always love, like if I, if I can use a rotary cutter over scissors, I'm going to use the rotary cutter. And if that's the case, then you need a cutting mat. Cutting mats, depending on the size, uh, you might spend $15, $20 for a small one. You can get one that's big. Mine I've had for years. I think I may have paid $30 for it. It's not very big. And so as you're cutting out uh, different m materials, you may have to move it and shift it around so that you can get underneath of whatever it is that you're cutting, especially if what you're cutting is kind of big. But you also need pins for holding your fabric together. So those little pins that have the colorful balls on the end, you can get those for a couple dollars. You definitely need thread. And not all thread is, I, not all thread is equal. Not all thread is equal. And I cannot remember the name of the thread that I like to use. I think it might be like Gutterman, but it's like a polyester thread. You don't want to just get 100% cotton. I find that that tends to break very easily and you don't want to sew anything, especially upholstery fabrics with something that's going to be easy to break. Extra bobbins, a marking pen. So your marking pen, when you're putting uh, marks on your fabric, you want to be able to mark it. But then sometimes people use chalk. When I did my upholstery class for the wingback chair that I made, that's the only thing that the, that the teacher used was chalk because it comes off very easily. It's not going to stain your fabric. So let's just say chalk, although there are some marking pens that will wash out, but chalk or mark, marking pen. You'll definitely need a small ruler and a yardstick and a gauge for seams. This is one of my favorite tools because whenever you're sewing two pieces of fabric together, your seam generally is going to be about half an inch. If you're doing clothing, clothing tends to be a, a five eighths inch seam, but for upholstery, curtains, those kind of things, half inch is pretty standard. And you want to make sure that you're marking your seam before you're putting your fabric together to sew. Well, when you put your fabric together, you want to mark your seam. And if you've got a little gauge, it's like a little handheld metal thing that has a sliding piece of plastic, a little stopper that you can slide along to where you want that gauge to stop. So those things, a couple, you know, couple dollars, two, three dollars, and I use it every single time I'm sewing. And this is something that I want to get. <laughs> and I found that I really needed this when I was doing the uh, sewing for the, the canopy, a seam guide. And this is a little magnetic thing that just goes right onto most, well, most sewing machines, well, sewing machines can be plastic, but right where you're sewing, that part tends to be metal. And when you look on a sewing machine, it's got lines there and it tells you like, hey, this is the half inch mark, this is five eighths inch. And you can use that as you're sewing your, your seam. You use that by keeping your fabric lined up with that marking, but it's very hard to do. Like as you're sewing, especially the faster you go, it's hard to keep that stuff straight. So this seam guide can literally sit on that, I guess it's called the throat, can literally sit on the throat or the plate. And as you're running your fabric through, as long as it's next to that, that seam guide, you know exactly that all your, you know, all your seams are going to be the same distance, right? Because that right there is a huge giveaway that you are a beginner. If one part of your seam is like half inch, another one's five eighths inch, and it just looks all wonky, that's a pretty good, you know, pretty good way to tell that somebody is new or just really doesn't know how to sew. So a seam guide is pretty important. I don't yet have one, but I saw one online and I was like, oh, I want to get that. Because usually I just use whatever markings are on the, on the plate. But again, sometimes that doesn't really work too well because your fabric is, especially slippery fabrics, they want to move all over the place. Now you might be wondering, well, isn't sewing really hard though? Like you might not have the confidence to do it. You think, yeah, well, my auntie, she was really good. My grandmother was good. My sister is really, really good. But me, I don't think I have a lot of talent. Well, I'm here to tell you that you can learn how to sew. It's really not that hard. I mean, there's there's a few things. I mean, I'm sure there's more than just these six, but I think there are several things for me that have always been pretty powerful when it comes to sewing and being able to do it well. 
and not even do it well, but just understanding the basics, right? Like with every tool that you're going to use, there's certain basics that you just learn along the way. And I think if you can learn these basics, then it's really not that difficult. Then once you've learned the basics, then you can start adding on all the other things that make people like a really, really good sewer. But like tip number one, learn to use a straight line by using seam guides. I just talked about that seam guide because as I mentioned, some fabrics are just very, very slippery. And sometimes even when you're sewing, you may not even have enough space to have everything stretched out. That's what happened to me when I was sewing the mosquito netting. It was so big and bulky. And my shed, my she shed still is not set up. Oh my gosh, that's she shed. (laughs) It's going to take me probably another year to get that thing done. I'm so slow. But I didn't have all the space I needed to stretch things out. And so the material kept, kept like just shifting on me. And so some of my seams, actually all my seams were not very pleasing, (laughs) but I figured who's going to be looking that closely. I don't care. But if you get into the habit of using seam guides and having your sewing area set up so that you have enough space for your fabric to stretch out, so it's not falling down and pulling it over to the left or you know, off of your, your table, then you're going to learn how to sew straight lines. I mean, that is the main thing is being able to take two pieces of fabric, put them together and be able to join them. And tip number two, you really just have to understand that when you're sewing a seam, you're literally, I mean, let me just, I'm making this very, very basic because there's different types of seams and ways you can sew them. But generally a good rule of thumb is to sew a seam, just remember put the right sides together. Okay. So if you're looking at a piece of fabric, let's say you've got a piece of upholstery fabric and you're making a pillow. Well, there's going to be like a nice, pretty colorful side. And then the other side is, you can tell that that's the wrong side of the fabric. Well, if you're sewing a pillow together, you're going to put those right sides, those colorful sides together, line up the edges, and then do your half inch seams around the pillow of course, leaving one side open so you can actually flip it inside out. (laughs) I don't want to get into too many details, but if you can always remember to put your right sides together and then sew them, when you open it up, you'll see this beautiful seam with your, with your pieces of fabric together. And now when you flip it over, you'll see the seam and it's hidden underneath on the other side. So just remember right sides together. That's all you have to remember. (laughs) It's very basic. And then tip three, if you can follow directions, like if you're somebody who easily understands how to go from step one to step two, step three, then you can follow a pattern. Now that's more so if you are doing uh, like clothing and things like that, you'll find patterns, but I don't think, I don't see very many patterns for, uh, for other things. Uh, related to the home. Like you might see pillow patterns and things like that, but for the most part, I don't see those. I see, I'm not saying they don't exist. I usually will see uh, patterns for dresses and, and shirts and things like that. But I'm sure there are patterns that exist for home furnishings. And if you can follow directions, you can follow a pattern. And they, they literally tell you, step one, do this. <laughs> Here's a little picture of it. Step two, do this. And it's not that difficult. Like people would say, Oh my gosh, I can't believe you made those pants. I'm like, do you know how simple pants are to make? Like you literally have like two p pe- well, not two pieces, but you have like a front, a back, uh, you know, two fronts, two backs, you sew them all together. And then you've got a waistband, like that's it. It's not that difficult. And if you can follow a pattern, then follow directions, you can follow a pattern whether it's for the home, whether it's purses, handbags, you know, you can buy some patterns for those. And it's pretty simple to to actually do. And tip number four, practice threading a needle and learning how to sew up a seam with an invisible slip stitch. Okay, so I'm thinking of pillows, right? Now, when I've made pillows in the past, I've sewn them, but you can actually do them with no sew tape. I will leave a link down below. So if you want to look at that on how to make pretty little pillows and not have to actually sew them, you can find that. But let's say you're sewing a pillow and you have sewn, let's say, three and a half sides, okay? Because 
remember you're you're putting your fabric the colorful sides the right sides together and then you're going to sew a half inch seam all along the perimeter but in order to turn that pillow inside out you have to keep a little bit of an opening there and it has to be big enough for you to actually shove your pillow form in <laughs> But then when you do that, you flip it inside out, you put your pillow in there, it looks great, but now you have this seam that has to be covered up. You can't put it back on your sewing machine and sew it because it's going to look bad. You're going to see the stitching. So, and I'll find a link for you. I'll put it in the either the blog post or the show notes down below. But I would say practice learning how to sew seams with an invisible slip stitch. And this is basically just taking a hand sew, just hand sewing with a needle and thread and going in between sort of weaving in where that seam is going to be so you can close up that pillow and have it look seamless. You can do it. It's not that hard to do. I think I was doing these invisible slip stitch seams like way, way back. So if I, if I was really, really young doing those, you could do this. So that's a really important thing, I think, to, to be able to be successful in sewing. And then tip number five, I would practice putting in zippers. And I know it sounds intimidating. There's, there's several different ways to put zippers in. Like there's a zipper that you can put in if you want it to be completely invisible, right? Sometimes you'll see pillows with invisible zippers so that when you zip it up, you can't see any of the teeth of the zippers. You'll see them in dresses and like on the side of dresses those maybe not too difficult. It's been a while since I've put one of those in. Actually, I'm thinking like, how did I do that? <laughs> but there's those kind of zippers. There's like a lapped zipper. So maybe you kind of flip the fabric back a little and you can see the, the teeth hidden below that little lapped area. So there's different ways you can put zippers in. And I would tell you, practice this because if you can take two pieces of fabric and put a zipper in it, you could do all kinds of beautiful pillows. You could even sell them. You could start an Etsy shop and sell your own pillows, right? I know there's so many of you who are listening to this that you don't like your day job. <laughs> I get it. I was there. I hated my day job. No one that I hated my day job. I hated my, my manager actually. But you know, if you're looking for ways to make money outside of your day job, making pillows and finding amazing fabric and and creating these and selling them on Etsy, you can make a lot of money. You can make a lot of money. I mean, of course, right now we're in a recession, I guess. Maybe people aren't buying pillows, but who knows? Maybe you go to the thrift store and find some really inexpensive sweaters or, you know, different fabrics of dresses and you you buy them on 50% off days and then you turn those into pillows. Go over to the pillow section of the thrift store and find an old pillow <laughs> for $3 and get it, get an old dress. And then you can use the dress to cover the pillow that you got from the thrift store and turn it into something amazing. So as you can see, there are ways that you can make money with sewing and not knowing how to be like an elaborate seamstress or, you know, home sewer, but you have the basic skills. You have a basic uh, brother or singer machine, and that's all you need. So get comfortable putting in zippers. If you're doing pillows or anything like that, I would say get comfortable putting in invisible zippers and also learn how to remove stitches with a seam ripper. A seam ripper, I, for, I think I may have forgotten to even mention the seam ripper, but yes, that is one of the tools and notions that you definitely need. A seam ripper is going to be your best friend because mistakes always happen and you're going to sometimes have to start over or you don't like that you're seam looks a little wonky. So maybe you want to rip it out and start over or you accidentally got your fabric caught underneath of your seam when you were sewing it. Ask me how I know that happened to me all the time sewing this mosquito netting. <laughs> and then you've got to try to take it out. I didn't try to take it out with the mosquito netting because that stuff was so thin, it would have ripped. I just left it. Um, but you, you are going to have to learn how to remove stitches. I mean, that's just and inevitable. So if you can learn those those six things, straight lines, using this using a seam guide, putting your fabric right sides together, fo following a pattern, using zippers and being able to remove it, that's all you need to know. You can make pillows for your house. And I don't know about you, but I think pillows are expensive. I went to Home Goods. 
I guess it was maybe during the fall and I wanted to buy some pillows for the kids bedroom. When I did the kids bedroom makeover, those pillows were like $30 each. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is insane. Like I wanted to buy two pillows at 60 bucks for pillows. Really? So if you can learn how to do some of this stuff yourself, you have the pride of, of the fact that you made this, you might save a little money too. It just depends on the materials. Sometimes fabric can be so expensive. So if you can find other ways to use fabric, like dresses from the thrift store or, you know, go into the remnant section of the fabric store and finding things that are marked down like half off. These, these things will save you money. Sometimes you're not going to get the best fabrics from the remnant sections, but if you're just starting out, it doesn't matter. Once you get good and you feel confident in your sewing, they have so many beautiful fabrics. You don't mind spending $30, $40 for a yard. I mean, you're going to mind. But especially if you're making pillows or something that's small, you're not going to mind buying just one yard of fabric for a beautiful pillow that maybe if you had bought it at a store, it might have cost you $100. You know what I'm saying? Because fabrics can get really, really swanky. Anyway, that's what I got for you this week. I want you to think about if you're new to sewing, if you're new, if you've never even sewn before, maybe you've always wanted to try it. I'm hoping that this this episode will spark you to really look at sewing and think about how you might want to get a sewing machine, pull this into your repertoire of, of crafts that you can do because it really takes you to the next level. I feel this way about power tools, right? Like power tools, once you know how to use power tools, it just takes you to the next level because now whatever you have in your mind, you, you know, you may not have the skill, but you have the tools and you can learn how to go to the next level so that whatever idea you have in your mind, you can, you can actually act on it. (laughs) And the same thing is with sewing. If I didn't have a sewing machine, there's no way I would have been able to do the mosquito netting. There's no way I would have been able to do the garage door screen. I would have had to, to buy one and then... A lot of the ones that I saw on the market, they look, oh, they look so bad because they have the little, uh, what do you call them? The little uh, magnets. That's the word I'm looking for. They have the little magnets to keep them closed. Well, I don't know. They're, they're not very good magnets. I wanted something with a really good sturdy zipper that can be opened and closed. And that thing still holds up. I still have it in my garage. I haven't actually put it up because I have the other screen now, but I mean, that thing served me for a good two years. I was like, man, this was an amazing project. Anyway, think about sewing. How can you use it in your life? What are some things that you would like to make that you just never thought that you could? And I actually have a dress pattern that I bought some time ago that I really want to make. I even have the fabric for it. It's probably been, gosh, four years since I bought that pattern and the fabric. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to pull it out and start on it. I really love sewing and doing it in a, just a relaxed way where there's no deadline. I'm not doing it for a sponsored post or anything like that. I just really love sewing. So I am going to start a project. (laughs) I'm going to find this pattern and this fabric, and I'm going to make this dress. It's really cute. I'm hoping it turns out. It's been a long time, but it's that stretchy fabric and stretchy fabric can be so hard to work with. So I have to kind of pull out my, my memories of like, okay, I think there's a certain type of needle that I need for this fabric. So I got to do some research to make sure it turns out because it's going to be very cute. And also, you know what I've been wanting to make? I want to make like a romper. Somebody posted this on Facebook the other day. Remember when you were a kid, those little rompers that they tied at the shoulders and it was just like a little one piece thing. I saw that. I was like, oh, I remember wearing those. (laughs) And then I started going online looking for romper sewing patterns for women. So I'm going to, I'm going to find that too, because I feel like I want to make a romper. I want to make a romper. That'd be so much fun. Anyway, guys, that's what I got for you for episode 71 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. I'm actually going to be interviewing probably next week, a guy that you're going to want to listen to. He is a guy who created this new furniture stripping product. Remember back in a previous episode, I was talking about stripping gel and how I'd been using this chemical stripper that I thought it was safe. They said it was safe and it's soy gel based and all yada, yada, yada. Well, no, it had some ingredients that was toxic. Well, this guy had actually like sent me some of this 
this other material that it's totally non-toxic. And he and I are going to have a chat and you're going to hear that interview next episode. But in the meantime, I need to actually use the product (laughs) so I can tell whether or not it works. I don't want to like talk to him and say, oh yeah, this product works so well, having not used it, right? So I'm actually going to be doing some stripping samples. I think maybe I'll put those on a Facebook reel or Instagram reels reel so you can see the results. And then he and I are going to be talking this week. So next week, you should be able to hear that interview. And I'm going to record it too. So I might even put it on my YouTube channel so that you can watch the interaction, the interview between he and I. It's going to be nice. His name's Gary. And I can't remember the name of the product. But you'll see all of that next week. You'll hear all of that next week. So be ready because I'm excited about that episode. All right, guys, have a wonderful weekend and I will see you next episode. 